with an old you would not bring about change. It's already seven days, I think, so far, if not six. Please don't laugh at me and my date. It's already seven days or six, I don't know. Seven. But nothing has changed in the cosmos if nothing has changed in your life. So as we get excited about the new year, here's our first request at Hillview Church. Make decisions that represent you in a new way. If your habits are still old, if your attitude is still at the same as last year, if your way of doing things is still at the same as last year, the new year would not change anything in your life. A new year requires a new you. Put your hand on your chest and say, I want to be new. I can tell you four areas that you can make yourself new. Number one, new ways of thinking. A new year requires you to think differently. Here is how some experts have said it. They said you cannot solve today's problem by using yesterday's thinking. If you are still thinking like you are on your 20s, thinking the same way you used to think and expecting a different life in 2024, I'm sorry to be the one announcing the news. Your life is not going to change just because it's a new year. It's going to change because you have changed how you think. Number two, you can change your attitude. Your attitude towards life. Your attitude towards people. Your attitude towards work. Your attitude towards money. Nothing in this four spheres is going to change because it's a new year. How many of you want change in your workplace? You need to change your attitude towards your workplace. You need to change your work ethic towards your workplace. Nothing changes just because it's a new year. You change things for you to get the results that you want. Number three, you need to change your habits. Some of you eat a lot. It's just a simple habit you can change. Some of you eat unhealthy food. Some of you sleep a lot. Some of you are lazy. One of the things that I'm working on this year, on my side, is the sphere of laziness. I really want to improve on my work ethic. So what habits are you going to change that makes you new? So a new year requires a new you. And here's what we are saying this year, and we are adding into the new year, new you, is that we have the new year, which requires a new you, and here's what you have present in this new year. You have a same God. So that in case you flatter, in case you don't know what to do, there is something constant in this year. It is one person. His name is Jesus. The scripture says he's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. What does that mean? It means you can enter this year confident that the same God you served when you were young is still here with you. He says, I would never leave you nor forsake you. So here's what you have. You have a new gift called a new year. And you have the same God who is faithful, who is committed to your plans, who loves you, present. The question is, would you become new? Some of you love your old selves that you don't want to experience a new version of yourself. It's time to change you. If you are going to benefit in a new year, you have to experience newness of life in you. New thoughts, new attitude, new habits, new perspective. And I want to add something, which is the subject of my message today. You need to add into your newness six plus nine. Plenty. It's here. You need to add into your newness, six plus nine, plenty. I'm going to tell you a story about that. But I want to build a very strong biblical foundation before I tell you the story around six plus nine. I want to start this morning at Matthew chapter number 16. Matthew chapter number 16, if we can go there. And we are reading... Uh, Matthew 16, and we are reading verse number 19. 
So here's what it says. Jesus is speaking to Peter and he's speaking about the church. And he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth would be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth would be loosed in heaven. Now look at me. In the study of the Bible, there are things we call what? Keys. Say keys. Say keys. Keys are things that open things or unlock things or make things happen. The life of a believer and the life of a church functions on keys. These keys are given within the parameters of scripture. In other words, God has given you keys, which are resources that can make your life become successful. He has promised that he's building his church on the rock, and he will provide his church with keys so that the gates of hell or the devil would not prosper against the church. So there are several keys in the Bible. Those of us who study the Bible, study the Bible from a thin perspective or from a keys perspective. Let me give you an example about a key that you know that is important at the beginning of, a, of the year. This key is called prayer. How many of you agree with me that prayer is a key? So prayer is a key because there are certain things that won't happen in your life unless you pray. There are certain things that in order for you to overcome them, you need prayer. So prayer is a key. You can never become successful as a believer in your life, in achieving your dreams and desires without prayer. So prayer is a key. What does that mean? It means there are certain locks in the natural and in the spiritual that requires a certain key called prayer. One of the problems with Africans in general is that this is one of the keys that we have known from childhood. And this is one of the keys that we have abused. And this is one of the keys. Yes, we have abused it because we, each door requires a key. Is that true? Now, one of the things that we have done as the African church is to use the key of prayer in every door. And guess what would happen? the key would fail to function in other doors. And guess what resolution or conclusion you make of that key? You would think this key is not working because you have used it in the wrong lock and it cannot open wrong locks. So one of the things that majority of us have done wrongly is to assume that prayer unlocks every door. So we have prayed for things that requires other keys. Hear me properly. Prayer is a key, but there are other keys that needs to be used together to open certain rooms that you require. If you become a believer who does nothing and then expect prayer to open certain doors for you, you become disgruntled and you blame God for not doing certain things because you assume just because you prayed, God should act on them. So as a church this year, I think from next week, Monday, we are starting a prayer and fasting that we want to pray and seek God because we believe in this key called prayer. It's important. So next week when we call you every day for five days to come and pray, please show up because there are certain things in your life that nothing else would help you except prayer. But this year... I want to sit on a different key for the first three months. And this is not our theme, but I'll tell you a story why I want to start with 6 plus 9 planning in this year. I want to sit on a certain theme, not theme, key called wisdom. Wisdom is also a key that God has given to us so that in our spiritual journey, there are certain things that would happen to us not because we have prayed, but because we have applied wisdom as found in scripture. Christ is called the wisdom of God. The expression of Christ 
as wisdom is the ability to make accurate decision using God's weight. Somebody asked me, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to make apt decisions. Decisions that benefit you more are called wisdom. When you are able to make decisions with less bad consequences, then you are applying yourself wisely. One of the things that God has given to us as a resource and a key is the ability to tap in his word to find wisdom. So at its highest level, wisdom is a product of knowledge. Knowledge is not power. I know they've taught a lot about that, that knowledge is power. But knowledge is only power when applied accurately, which means it has been transformed into what? Into wisdom. Majority of us know a lot of things that have never helped us, never benefited us. Wisdom is the practice of knowledge that benefits us to become better. And there are things that won't happen in your life except and until you act wisely. A new year requires that we act wisely. There are people who do things the same way every year and expect different results. And it never works. Some authors call those people fools. But if you are to apply yourself and get results, you need what? Wisdom. The ability to use God's way. Now, here's one of the requirements of wisdom. Is that wisdom requires that you know how things are done. Okay, let me qualify that better. Wisdom requires that you know how things ought to be done. I think it's best that way. That in order for you to apply yourself accurately, you need to know or to possess information that helps you to understand what those things require. At its broadest level, wisdom is contextualized in the word of God. I was talking to my, to my nephew, a PhD holder and a, a lecturer at BUS. So he was telling me that one day, so he has done geophysics, what, what's so, so, so he put it in his status that one day the earth would do whatever and it will be consumed by fire and then whatsoever. So I said to him, I said to him, that's what the scripture refers to when it says the old earth shall be, be gone and it shall be consumed, it shall be thrown into the lake of fire. No, he says, no, there's a fire, what else? whatever, I can't explain that. But here's what I'm trying to say. Science and any other type of wisdom, it's always coming after what God's wisdom has already said. So you need wisdom to contextualize things. And this morning, I want to start by answering basic questions. Please follow me carefully. The first question I want to answer is about the year. Because here at Hillview Church, I want to correct misconception so that we all move towards growing ourselves and understanding God and applying ourselves at wisdom level. Go with me, if you can, to Psalms. Psalm 65. Psalm 65, verse number 11. 65, verse number 11. Here's what it says. You crown the year with abundance. Okay. You crown the year with your goodness. I'm reading my version. And your cards overflow with abundance. Okay, let me read, let me read my version uh, so that you can follow it easily from. You crown the year with abundance. No, with goodness. No, that's a wrong that's a wrong version. Uh, yes. Thou crownest the year with thy goodness, and thy path drop fatness. Now I want to answer a few important questions. How does God create a year? Please listen. How does God create a year. Okay, let me answer the first question. What is a year? A year is a number or spectrum or time 
that God compresses together in a box. We call that box 12 months, 365 days, or a year. So in simple language, when God wants to create a new year, he puts a spectrum of time, which will rotate around the sun. And then, after he has done that time, here's what God does. He crowns that time, which is in a box. You can call that time 2024. This word crowns is a very interesting word in the Hebrew understanding. It means to enrich. Actually, it means to enrich through going through a cycle, which is very interesting because the process of creating a year, it, remember that the year is a product of the movement of the sun around the sun, of the earth around the sun. So God cycles the year. In the process of that cycling of the year, he crowns it. What does that crown mean? He enriches it. The next question, what does God use to enrich a year? Which is what? The number of days or the number of months. What does God use to enrich those number of days? He enriches it with what? His goodness. So that in every year, if you cut through a year, what would you find? Goodness in the year. Secondly, he then put in his path of rotating and moving around the year, he drops abundance. That version uses the word fatness. So that anyone who would circle through the year like him, at any point of moving through the year, can experience what? Fatness. So that, this is what it means, before 2024 was released, God enriched it. Crowned it. You know how we crown Miss Botswana? We elevate his status. We increase her value. When you are crowned a queen, here's what it says. Value has been added to you. You are no longer the same person because you were crowned. 2024 is not the same because God crowned it with what? Goodness. We crown things with diamonds, with gold, with whatsoever to increase the value of the person. God has crowned the year with what? Goodness. So that when you get into the year, what should you find? Goodness. Say goodness. Amen. That God is good. And I know how that is also limited. Because you see, when we say God is good, say God is good. We are saying the same thing, but this same thing might mean different things to all of us. Because your God is good is based on your understanding of how you perceive goodness. But this goodness of God is so huge. And not only that, after God drops goodness, he then adds abundance. I'm going to the next level. We need to answer the question. What constitutes each year? If we are to open a year and find its constituents, what are some of the things that we would find in that year? And my answer is still here. We would find what? Goodness would find what? Fatness. Call it what? Abundance. Change the word from abundance, call it what? Wealth. Riches in a year. So here's my first, and this is very important to me, because I had, a, I had a chat with somebody here, I think on Friday, and this was still so rich on me. So he says, last year was bad. And I say, no, this year's beginning. He says, yeah, let's hope this year would become good. And then I said, badness and goodness does not reside in a year. And, and that's the problem with this. You know how Botswana we say, and there's no year that dislikes you. There's no year that has a bad plan for you. And, and here's the problem with that thinking, that perspective, is that if you think the year is bad, like 2024, your year in January may start with an obstacle. That obstructs you to go towards what? Goodness. Obstructs you to go towards what? Fatness. And just because of just a setback in January, you give up, you say, this is a bad year. So the year is never bad. God equips the year with goodness, with fatness. Every year, there is no male year. How 
A year is always fertile, filled with goodness, filled with fatness every year. And here's the problem. So I'm having dialogue with this guy. And with due respect. So, so he says, the year was bad. And, and I'm saying to him, you know what happens? When you think like that, you are going to blame the year and stop there. Because you can't change the year. But when you recognize the year from God's perspective, that it is filled with goodness and it is filled with fatness, here's the next question. How can I get the goodness? Because I'm experiencing the badness. How can I get to the fatness? How can I get into the abundance? Now your perspective changes towards pursuing the ideals of the year. And as much as God plans the year, fills it with goodness, filled it with fatness, there is the devil who never wants you to go towards anything that is good for your life. So his strategy is to obstruct you to go towards what is good, to obstruct you to go towards abundance, to obstruct you to go towards the fatness that God has dropped. And then you are going to stand and say, and you blame God. There are no blessings. There's nothing you are doing in my life. And God said, I've filled the year. It's your role to go and get the fatness. And this is why even our praying has to change. Because some of us pray that the year should be good. Lord, let this be a good year. And God wonders at your prayer. Lord, I pray 2024 should be mine. God says, I've already given it to you. It's yours. Oh, God, make it good. God says it's already good. So we pray wrong prayers. And wrong prayers leads to us to act wrongly. And wrong prayers leads us to hope and expect to see things wrongly. And we waste a good year filled with goodness, fatness, abundance, because we are praying wrongly. Let this year be mine, Lord. Oh, let every year is yours. Lord, let this year be good. No, every year is good. The question is, how can I get goodness and abundance in every year? And I want to introduce you into a concept which is an aspect of wisdom called 6 plus 9 planning. Last year, the Lord impressed to me that I need to plan for 15 years of my life. Yeah, so you are benefiting. This is not for you. You are benefiting because you are here. Yeah, but this was for me. That I need to have a plan for the next 15 years. I think I walked throughout the year dwelling on that thought and wondering. And I did a little bit of my research and I recognized. Here's what the first thing that I recognized. All successful organizations and individuals plan for over 50 years. 50 years. And I know as a country we are still struggling on 20. And then I came into something that changed my life and my thinking. And this is why I'm allowing you to benefit in this thing so that all of us, 6 plus 9 is a planning tool that I want us to do as Hillview Church so that in the next 15 years, we would have become better. Here's one of the things that motivated me to do that. It was to find out that God blesses several things in our lives. Most of you are used to the blessing that God puts on your life. I can you know that God can bless you, like your life. And you also know that God can bless the works of your hands. I get and you also know that God can bless uh, uh, your livestock. But the Lord led me to see that he wants to bless my plans. And it was the first revelation I saw. And that the greatest blessing that God can do to anyone... When God blesses your life, when you die, it's over. The blessing ceases. When God blesses the works of your hand, when you stop working. Actually, the problem with that is for majority of you, you are working with your hands and your hands works for other people. So it is the people that you are working for who get the blessing. But when God blesses your plans of 50 years, of 100 years, of 15 years, your plans they get blessed and you have continuity. Are you following me? Let's start first of all in Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number 9. Yeah, so I want you to follow me slightly. I want to lay this foundation very well. Proverbs 16, verse number 9. Here's what it says. It says, In their hearts, 
Okay. A man's heart divides his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So we understand. Let me read it in my version here. It says, in their hearts, women plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Can I teach you something in a minute? Look at me. Say parallelism. Come and say it like you know what it means. Parallelism. Now, here's what parallelism, the, 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 the book of Proverbs is being written through a comparison, comparative language, and parallelism. So, in parallelism, you are always seeing two sentences, and those two sentences are called couplets, and they compare what the main agent or the main character in the story is doing. So, you can learn that. So, here in this verse, there are two characters. The one, first character is what? It's man. And what he does is parallel to what the next character is doing. Who is the next character there? The Lord. Now, here's what it means. In a man, in his heart, a man does what? Plans. After the man has planned, what happens? The Lord determines the steps that are requisite for the acquisition or accomplishment of the plan. Now, if you don't have the plan, how is the Lord going to direct you? So six plus nine means I want all Hillview partners to plan for the next six years up to 2030. And then for the next nine years up to 2039. We're going to be working on six plus nine for the next 15 years every first three weeks of the month to evaluate that. And we're going to be looking at six areas that you need to plan for in order for you to acquire goodness and abundance that is in every year. So I'm going to be helping you. So in the next two, two weeks that are left, I'm going to be looking at six areas that you need to plan for in order for you to experience goodness and abundance. But so, so, so a man's role is to plan. Say this with me. Say God is a planner. Say I'm made in the image of God. You know what that means? God becomes successful as the greatest being on earth because he plans. He plans to the extent that even Jesus was, he planned for risk. That if Adam fails, Jesus was killed before the creation of the universe. That means God plans and has a secondary plan in case what he had planned failed before it happened. What makes the God of the Bible to be so rich and not die is that he plans things. And when you say, I am made in the image of God, at a very lower level, or highest level, I think, not lower, highest level, here's what you, you are saying. I act like God does. And for God to act, he has what? A plan. Majority of you would call it, Deuteron not Deuteronomy, Jeremiah 29, 11. I know I have what? The plans I have for you. Now the question is, do you have the plan for yourself? Wisdom Listen to this. Wisdom is the ability to have the plans that matches God's plans. Majority of us boast about God's plans. But when we come to your plan, nothing. How are you planning to make money in 2024? How are you planning to make your relationship rich? How are you planning to become better in 2024? How are you planning to do more? What's your plan for your children? What's your plan for retirement? The scrabble of Africa is the highest expression in history of what happened when people plan. They can get whatever they want, including buying people. The problem with us is that majority of us don't have plans. And I can tell you, a majority of you, the question would be, what if it fails? And I've argued, it is better to have a failed plan than to have a no plan. And here's what we know about planning, is that th those who do not have the plans are the slaves of those with the plans. We also know that all employees, all employees, with due respect, <laughs> Proverbs, Proverbs 16, verse 3. Let's, let's go to Proverbs 16, verse 3. Now, here's the question, and I'm not laughing about it. Are you planning to ever become an employer? Are you planning to ever to have an extra source of income? Are you planning to ever become married? 
Have you ever, for those of us who sit in the counseling room, sometimes you can f find people that love each other, but they have never planned to marry. So the circumstances around them makes the love difficult. And I've also met people who have never planned to retire. Three, commit to the Lord. Now, remember what? Parallelism. Look at the parallelism. Commit to the Lord whatever you do. And your plans will succeed. Now, we need to change the version there. I think we need to. Yeah. So, so mine says commit to the Lord whatever you do. And he will establish what? Your plans. Now, look at what the scripture says. The first doing part is that you commit to the Lord whatever you do do. Majority of us have something that we are doing. But whatever we do is not attached to a plan. So if you don't have the plan, the Lord does not establish a thing. He has nothing in the planning aspect that he will cause to be established. Because you have limited yourself to doing. I told you how the Lord impressed this in my heart that if I only do things and I don't have plans, he will only bless what I do and he will not bless the plans. And I need the blessing in my life, the blessing in what I do, the blessing in what I keep, and the blessing in my plans. And the greatest blessing that God puts on anything is on the plans because the plans can live longer than the individual. And this is the tragedy of Africa. We want the blessing on us, but we don't have the plans that God can bless for our continuity. So six plus nine. Six things you need to plan for your life. Let me show you the last verse. And I'm still on uh, Proverbs 16. Just give us verse number one because Proverbs 16, it's, it's a planning verse. Its theme is planning. Look at verse number one of the saying. Here's what it says in my version. To whom ends belongs the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the time. To man belongs what? The plan of the heart. What's your plan? It's 2024. What's your plan? What's your plan about people? What's your plan about relationship? What is your plan about money? What is your plan about work? What is your plan about time? What is your plan? And if you don't have the plan, now this verse implies three things. So you plan. After you have planned, you communicate it to the Lord through what? Prayer. It's embedded. And then the Lord responds to what? to your tongue, what you have said to him. Now the problem with majority of us in the church is that in a new year, we would come here and shout it, Lord, money. Lord, this. And then the plan, nothing. Can I define a plan for you? A plan is a documented strategy of how things are going to be done. A documented strategy of how Things are going to be done. So if you have it in your head, it's not a plan. You have an idea. We love you. But if it is in your head only, it's not a plan. It's an idea. It can change. It's vulnerable to your floating mind. It's vulnerable to whatever circumstances and to people around you. Now, a plan means a documented strategy of how things ought to be done. If you were to meet an investor today and he says to you, give me your personal profile, your personal strategy of life, would you have a documented strategy of how you want to live your life and your life? All successful organizations, all high any individuals, one of their major characteristics was that they have a documented strategy of how things ought to be done. And the Lord spoke to me a year ago when I was 45. Develop a 15-year strategy of how you want things to be done. Because I bless the plans. If you don't have them, I can only bless what you are doing today. And stop and wait for you. Because planning does not belong to God. Planning for our life. God has finished the planning for our lives. You now have to decide what do you want? What do you want to become? 
it is interesting when you study the Hebrew of the first word that was used to Adam when God said he should till or work out the ground. Its etymology means become. When God was saying to Adam, work out, he's saying, choose who you want to become in this garden. And God wants us to grow and have plans of who we want to become. So in this series, I'm going to look at six important areas of our lives that we need to plan for. The first one is soul wealth. I've decided to add among all these areas wealth because we are planning on one thing, how to get goodness and abundance from each year. Can we agree that there's goodness and abundance in each year? You all saw it again. Now the next thing is, how can we get abundance and goodness? And combine abundance and goodness, you get the word what? Wealth. So there are six areas that I want to deal with in the next two weeks that are important and I want every partner to attend. It's important, we're going to be producing a document that I want you to have so that you have a documented strategy. Can, can I tell you something simple? Do you know why you are a believer? Do you know why you are born again? It's because God documented his thoughts. Simple. And he continued through his thoughts that he documented to live for thousands of years. What do you have documented that can represent you in your absence? A plan is important. And please, let's not get into the debate. What is the importance of writing it? No, I'm past that stage. What if it doesn't happen? No, I'm past that stage. You need a documented strategy of how you're going to live your life. Ask me about the greatest conflict in the African communities. Is that we fail even to plan for what happens when we die. And we create more problems in our absence because we couldn't decide what needs to be done. Plenty is God's character. As a believer, you need to plan. So, I want us to look into six areas. Number one, soul wealth. Number two, spiritual wealth. Number three, social wealth. Number four, financial wealth. Number five, physical wealth. Number six, wisdom wealth. I guess I get back lesson. Yeah, I confused them. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to say them again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As a pastor, there should be some things that you know. Yeah. It is unto men to plan. And God responds to the time. I'm closing this session. My time is up now. I have a question for you. Do you have a plan? And if you don't, this is not a blame the victim preaching. I'm going to help you develop the plan. Here's my objective in sharing this message to you. And I've told you, God never told me, teach the congregation about uh, uh, 15 years of planning. I'm sharing it with you because I love you and I have an obligation in making you better. If you are here and you are part of this church, we want your life to become better. We want you to have a life that is more orderly. We want you to improve. None of you in 15 years, if you are still the same, would expel you out of this church. <laughs> Literally. None of us would remain the same. In 15 years, we all should look different. But you can choose to remain behind. Stuck said it the other way around. That processes are going to push you down. So I'm sharing it with you so that you take responsibility over your life to plan for what you want. And as you close the service today, I want all of us to stand. And as we stand in this new year, there may be some of you who have come to church and you don't know Jesus, the wisdom of God. 
as your savior, can you plan this year to start your life with God? And we are here to help you. So in case you are here, maybe you have never done church, maybe you have done church a long ago, but you feel you are not confident on your relationship with God. And you want to leave this place assured that you and Jesus are together and you can trust him for his plan and trust him with your plan. If that's you, just lift up your hand. I want to pray with you. You want to accept Jesus as your savior. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for those hands. Let's keep them raised. Thank you for those hands. Yeah, thank you for those hands. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I want to ask all of you who have raised up your hand, if you can come here, I want to pray with you. Let's clap hands for them as they come. Just come, don't be shy. Just come, just come. Just come.